discuss some other problems, not the problems of the whole organ, but the fragments of this organ which are disseminated in the recipient, and what kind of biological importance it may have. And in my presentation, which might be very provocative, but it's based on a lot of objective evidence from animals and, and patients, transplanted patients, I would like to raise the point, the, the problem, probably not the problem of today, but the problem of the near future of dissemination of donor DNA and raise the question whether it enters the recipient cells and which cells it may enter and the, what we should tell the patients. Of course, the patients, neither we nor the patients are very much aware of what may happen biologically but if you have a recipient who is a molecular biologist, they, he may ask you today. And as he knows 10 times more about genetics and DNA, it would be very difficult for us to answer. Well, donor organ DNA is disseminated all over the recipient body in migrating passenger cells and in donor parenchymal cell debris at the time of rejection. I'll show some evidence for it in a moment. The process of DNA shedding occurs during reperfusion, and this applies to syngenaic transplants as well as to allogeneic transplants. And then in allogeneic combination, of course, acute rejection and chronic rejection when it comes to the disintegration of the next place of the cells of the organ. Now the question which arises is, what is the fate of the donor genetic material? Is it totally degraded in blood? Is it internalized by macrophages and dendritic cells and degraded? Or it's not degraded, but incorporated into the recipient genome? And it sounds like a fantasy, but I'll show you also some of the data from the literature which substantiate this type of, of approach or suggestion. And the last is what might be the biological consequences of donor DNA incorporation into recipient genetic apparatus. So what are the ethical aspects of donor DNA dissemination in recipient body? Should we inform patients about the internalization of donor genes in their cells, if it is the case? But certainly there is some evidence for it. Or do it only at the request of patients? And if so, what should we tell them? Next, please. I would like to divide my presentation into three parts. And the first will be about the present state of knowledge on localization of donor DNA in recipient tissues. And the second will be about some speculations, including my own thoughts, about the biological significance of this transplantation effect. And then point C will be, when asked by patients, what should we tell them? Now, we know that now, and it has been studied since uh, the 70s of this uh, last century that if there is a damage to the organ or even a surgical wound, the DNA from the damaged disintegrated cells locates in the lymph nodes. Now, of course, it, there were no research means good enough to, to, to follow the fate of DNA. But what we know now is that in the early events, in the time of reperfusion in the, uh, immediately after, after transplantation, the passenger cells lodge in the lymphoid organs, the dendritic cells, they migrate out and they also go to the lymphoid organs of the recipient. And there are endothelial cells which are usually disintegrated, some of them at least. They're taken up by macrophages, granulocytes, and dendritic cells. And these cells are very special in this respect. I will explain it in a moment. During acute rejection, there is, of course, organ cellular debris, and all three populations next place, they just eat up this, this material. Now, the DNA of the donor can be presented in passenger cells, in non-damaged cells, and it's well known from the, all the works on microchimerism, cellular microchimerism. It may be also presented in a soluble, free form, and also as, as nuclear fragments which can be taken up by the cells. Next, please. Now, uh, what is the fate of the DNA from donor cells? 
it may be, if it's soluble in body fluids, it may be degraded because there's plenty of nucleases. And I, of course, everybody of us knows that there is a certain level of free, I mean, protein bound, of course, uh, DNA in, in body fluids. So uh, in our serum, in our lymph and, and other fluids, there is a certain amount and we have been studying it thoroughly with our molecular biologists. But it's being cut into very small fragments. Now, in macrophages, it's also degraded by, by local enzymes. But the situation is different in dendritic cells, and we have plenty, of course, of, of, of these cells in not only in the lymphoid organs, also the, in the non-lymphoid organs. And there is an uptake by allogeneic, but not by syngeneic uh, uh, material. Now, the question is, is it degraded or is it not? Now, we have analyzed this, and uh, now I'll present some evidence from our experimental studies and also human experience. And this is the technique of analysis of the DNA cross-sex transplantation. So we're looking next, please, for the, for the SRY fragment. And this is, these are the probes, so I'm not going to go into details of the technique, which is very well known. Next, please. But what we found is, is extremely interesting. And the first thing is... On this slide, you see the bands, and the red arrow shows exactly the, the SRY fragment on the electrophoresis. And this was in a rat after transplantation of heart on the seventh day at the time of transplantation. So we can detect in all these tissues, these were cellular fragments, of course, cells taken from bone marrow, skin, and, and other organs, as you see here listed, and in all of them, there was diff a different concentration, but we could detect the donor, donor uh, SRY fragment. Now, strangely enough, I, I'm not showing here the data. There was an inverse relationship between the concentration of the, of the donor cells, the passenger cells in the recipient lymphoid organs to the, to the concentration of DNA, which was measured in, of course, arbitrary unit optical density. But the less there was cells, passenger cells, the more DNA w could we detect in the, in the tissues. And uh, here you, you can see after transplantation of, of skin, bone marrow, bone marrow with skin in, in concentration in, in different uh, is tissues of the recipient. There, there are differences, of course. You see in the blood there is much less than in other organs. And if there is less rejection as there was a combination of skin and, and BMC transplantation. There was less DNA because it's always related to the, to the intensity of rejection. Next, please. And here I show what happens in the syngeneic and allogeneic system. And again, this was seven days after heart transplantation. In both systems, you see that there is even more of it, of the, of the detected material in the syngeneic system. Now, why? Because there is more perfusion of this organ than in the allogeneic, but again, it's in, in both of them. Next, please. Now, and then we try to lo localize the DNA from the, from the e e donor. And we e separated cells on, in three different steps. The step number one, number two, these were also macrophages, which contained the, the fragments of, of donor, donor cells. But in the third one, third step, there were only pure dendritic the cells from the spleen. And the, what we found was that in, in allogeneic dendritic cells, we could find the detect the donor DNA, but not in, in syngeneic. Of course, this can be discussed uh, concerning the techniques and, 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 and the findings, but certainly it's uh, in, in quite a number of, of, of experiments, it, it, it was found uh, that there was no donor DNA in, in the syngeneic. So maybe the, the, the dendritic cells just took up the allogeneic fragments with the fragments of membrane with the MHC fragment, etc. But this is for discussion. I, yet another forum, I don't want to discuss it today. I only wanted to, to focus on the problem of DNA in the recipient body, which is spread all over. Next, please. Now, some examples from our clinical experience. And these are, we have quite a number now, much more than two of the ladies who received five years ago a male donor kidney. And the, here you can find, you see where the, the arrow points. Uh, the amylogenin, it's, it's, it's male, 
male DNA, which is present in the extract of cells, of the blood cells. We also have some specimens from the biopsy of the, of the colon mucosa, and also we could detect some of the donor DNA five years after transplantation. Now, you, you may think that these are the passenger cells which are still alive. Well, no. In our case, we could not detect presence of any cells. And also, as I mentioned before, in the experiments, the less cells we had, the more DNA. So there was an inverse relationship. Next, please. So, can the donor DNA be built in into recipient cell DNA? That's a basic question. This is something like a fantasy. At least sounds like that at the moment. And there are some examples of natural and artificial exogenous DNA utilization. DNA viruses, naked DNA with bacterial plasmid, which dermatologists supply now clinically. Then selected genes with viral vectors. This is gene therapy for contemporary medical procedure. We know now that, now that cell fusion with polyploidy can be formed. You take one embryonic stem cells and just adult cells and the fusion. If you look in the RAST issues of Nature Medicine, there, is, there are two articles on it. And then nucleus replacement, well, cloning. Does it happen? Does it occur in, the, in nature? Well, we still don't know. But if we just mimic what the nature shows us, so, so most likely something like that may also happen in vivo. And then DNA receptors on platelets and lymphocytes discovered some 30 years ago and totally forgotten. And, the, and of course, the, the last thing is we, we should, in order to incorporate DNA immediate, almost immediately into another cell, we should have the functional fragments of DNA with sticky ends. But this is the wishful thinking only. Putative products of biological effects, because we should have the product of the gene if they really exist, if they have been transferred to the recipient. So what are the bi uh, products and biological effects of, of donor fragments incorporated into recipient somatic cell genetic machinery? Well, this is, of course, what we can expect. This, we don't have evidence for it yet. Well, tolerance to donor MHC antigens. This is what we would wish all. And maybe there is something in it in when we transplant bone marrow cells and, and all this business uh, of, of, my, of microchimeries. Now, there might be donor isoenzymes, donor cell antigens expressed on the recipient cells, but of genetic origin of the donor. Now, if there is penetration, or there might be penetration, of the donor DNA through the blood-brain barrier, would they be incorporated in neural cells and change our conscience? In, well, that's pure, pure fantasy. But why not think about it? Now, you, I have listed some other points here. Uh, especially important is, can we also transfer uh, genes which would uh, make somebody susceptible to rheumatoid arthritis or any other genetically conditions uh, diseases? Next, please. So, to end, uh, what should, we, should, should the patient know if he wants to know about this problem? Well, I don't know what has happened here on the, because was with the computer, we should tell the patient that the donor DNA is present beside the graft in your tissues. It originates from the graft blood and tissue migrating cells as well as from disintegrated cells. And point C, donor cells which lodge in your, next please. Let's go to point D to shorten. The macrophages and granulocytes have enzymes which degrade DNA to small fragments. Dendritic cells, as it's known from recent experiments, retain DNA for a long time in their body. Now the question mark is in the cytoplasm. So far not known whether it's taken up by the, by the nucleus. But it's very likely that it is. Now could DNA fragments be incorporated into the recipient genome in its studies? Theoretically, this it can take place. There is indirect evidence of artificial incorporation of exogenous DNA in the chromosomes, and nature provides such examples. And the other point is today, we don't have enough knowledge to say what will be or already are the consequences of utilization of donor functional fragments of DNA by the recipient. So uh, these are just, just the, this is, has been a summary of uh, what I would say uh, to a biological 
molecular biologist who would be a candidate for kidney or liver transplantation if he asked me. Of course, it might be pure fantasy, but there are some, some natural examples which should make us think that it's, it's possible and, and in the future the problem of dissemination of DNA will be another problem to discuss at conferences like ours. Just to end, I should tell you that I received a letter from the, one of the editors of the outstanding transplantation organs, uh, transplantation <laughs> journals, to my, to my article, and he wrote to me that, well, DNA, once it leaves the cell, is, has no biological activity, and it's an end product. So I leave this without comment.